thank you. So I will be speaking about the right opposition uh, in the Communist Party of Yugoslavia in the 1920s and the uh, accusations of Austro-Marxism that they had faced. So I will try and reconstruct what their views actually were uh, and then uh, present what their relationship to Austro-Marxism was arguing essentially, as you can see from the title, uh, that they weren't Austro-Marxists, but then trying to understand why the Comintern considered them Austro-Marxists and uh, in what ways Austro-Marxism was instrumentalized as an accusation in the Communist International in uh, the 1920s. And I'm going to do it on the case study of Sima Markovic primarily, although I'm going to be looking at the so-called right opposition with the party, within the party more broadly. Uh, but uh, to begin with, uh, I'll explain a bit about Markovic, if I can just get this to work. Yeah. Ah, perfect. Yes. Uh, so why am I choosing Sima Markovic? Probably a lot of you are hearing this name for the first time, but in fact, he was essentially one of the three most significant uh, Yugoslav communists in the 1920s. Uh, he was a mathematician and a philosopher uh, by vocation. He also wrote a lot of books on uh, theoretical physics as well. Uh, he got his PhD in mathematics and taught as a professor at the University of Belgrade until he lost the post for political reasons. He was sacked for being a communist. Uh, but he uh, joined the revolutionary movement very early on. Uh, at the age of 19, in 1907, he became a member of the Serbian Social Democratic Party. And although this was an Orthodox Marxist party of the Second International, Markovic was actually a leader of an uh, uh, inter-party opposition of revolutionary syndicalists. So he essentially already then criticized uh, his comrades in the Social Democratic Party as reformists. Uh, he, uh, he supported direct action. And he supported turning general strikes into essentially mass strikes and an overthrow of the capitalist system, even in a context such as an underdeveloped Balkan country like Serbia. Uh, he was uh, expelled after a couple of years by the kind of orthodox Marxist core, uh, and he became politically passive. That's when he uh, finished his uh, PhD and got a university post. And uh, then over the uh, First World War, he became involved in politics again, and he essentially became a Bolshevik. He was impressed by uh, what he was uh, seeing, and he understood Bolshevism to be kind of the fulfillment of his revolutionary syndicalist uh, ideas that had inspired him before. Uh, he was one of the initiators of the uh, uh, of the accession of the Communist Party of Yugoslavia to the Third International in 1919 and became the first party secretary. Uh, he would later represent the party at the congresses of the Comintern, uh, and he was already then known as a, a very choleric person, so to say. He liked to argue a lot, and he was always kind of uh, speaking his mind at the Comintern congresses, and in spite of, or precisely because of this, uh, he had uh, he earned Lenin's respect, uh, and he became a member of the executive committee of the Communist International in 1921, sort of, you know, the, the government of the international communist movement, if you wish, and he would remain in that post for four years. Um, around 1923-24, uh, the debate on the national question began within the Communist Party of Yugoslavia. So essentially, uh, up until uh, that point, the party agreed on this idea of the so-called national unity, which uh, posited that Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes are a single Yugoslav nation. As the political realities of Yugoslavia began to shake that belief, Yugoslav communists entered into debates uh, and the story of a uh, Leninist self-determination uh, became kind of the catch, uh, <laughs> catchphrase of the day. So everybody uh, uh, inspired by the Comintern wanted to apply the theory of self-determination until secession uh, to the Yugoslav context, hoping that an alliance of communists with national revolutionary movements would help uh, bring about uh, a revolution in Yugoslavia faster. Markovic, however, opposed this course, um, and this is why he uh, be came to be called the rightist in the Communist Party of Yugoslavia. He essentially, um, he, he had his own ideas of how uh, the national question should be resolved, but the interesting thing is that uh, he used Stalin's premises from Marxism and the National Question in 1913, and based on them, built completely different conclusions. And this is when he started to get accused of Austro-Marxism. Uh, by 1925, he was even debating 
with Stalin at the uh, plenums of the executive committee of the Comintern. Stalin was kind of making the argument that, you know, this guy claims to be speaking for the Bolsheviks in the party, that he claims to be following my theory, but he's in fact wrong. And um, for a while, he gets marginalized because of this opposition to Leninist self-determination. But in 1926, the Comintern has a, what I call its unacknowledged right turn. So from 1926, the Comintern becomes more open to collaboration with uh, all sorts of reformist, uh, uh, even bourgeois political organizations. And in these couple of years, Markovic once again becomes party secretary. So even though he was kind of seen as the troubled child of the Yugoslav party for a few years, in 1926, he again becomes the leader. However, that changes very quickly because in 1928, of course, we have the so-called third period, which is when the communists completely um, uh, step away from any sort of uh, collaboration with the social democrats. As a matter of fact, they call them social fascists. And um, they uh, start focusing precisely on political alliances exclusively with the national revolutionaries. And this is when Markovic gets accused of being a factionalist. He gets expelled from the party in 1928 and is completely politically marginalized. Nonetheless, he's still a target of political persecution in Yugoslavia, of course. He's still considered a dangerous communist. He's exiled to uh, the countryside for a couple of years. And uh, he finally manages to move to the Soviet Union in 1935. Uh, he gets a post at the Soviet Academy of Sciences. Uh, he continues writing works on uh, dialectical materialism, but then becomes engulfed in the wave of purges that began uh, because he's seen as sort of the arch factionalist in the Yugoslav party of the 1920s. He's very soon uh, a target of investigation and one comrade calls him the Trotsky of the Communist Party of Yugoslavia. So needless to say, his fate was sealed. He was arrested in 1938 and he was uh, executed on false charges of espionage and links to Trotskyism in April 1939. Um, yeah. Can you, thanks. Yeah, so I want to speak a bit about the receptions uh, of Markovic uh, because um, uh, Markovic has been seen in Yugoslav historiography after the Second World War as an Austro Marxist. And like, you know, Walter quoted the great Soviet encyclopedia yesterday, that basically meant that he's an opportunist, that he's petty bourgeois, and especially that he's wrong on the national question. And this was basically just the kind of uncritical repetition of the accusations that were leveled by the Comintern, uh, because Bukharin and Zinoviev and Stalin considered him an Austro-Marxist, uh, then the Yugoslav historians also thought, thought of him as such. However, a, a shift came in the 1970s uh, as the kind of national uh, contradictions became more prominent in Yugoslavia. Uh, Markovic uh, came to be hailed by Serbian historians, uh, ethnically Serbian historians in Yugoslavia, as a sort of a Serbian patriot and a democrat. Uh, obviously, first the democratic part was, can you? <laughs> uh, the democratic part was emphasized. Uh, first, but uh, uh, but then uh, uh, but then the story of him as a Serbian patriot became more and more uh, dominant. Ah, there, I got it. Yeah, uh, it's all right. Uh, so basically, uh, he's. Uh, first, he's seen as a Democrat, and the standard for that essentially is pretty mechanical. The idea of the historians of the 70s is that if you agree with Moscow, you're automatically anti-democratic, whatever that means. And if you disagree with Moscow, you're automatically the keeper of the democratic traditions in the party. And of course, that was attributed also to the democratic traditions of Serbian social democracy. But that uh, theory just doesn't hold water. As I mentioned, he was not a social democrat. He was very much opposed to the social democracy of the Second International, and this doesn't tell us anything. But even more problematic is this idea of him as a Serbian patriot, because, or you know, uh, one, uh, it's a popular point of criticism among Serbian nationalist historians is that the first Yugoslavia, the Kingdom of Yugoslavia, was not in fact a greater Serbia. Yet somehow the guy who opposed the first, uh, the guys who opposed the first Yugoslavia are seen as anti-Serb in this historiography. So you know, there must have been something pro-Serbian about this monarchist Yugoslavia then, right? Uh, but he becomes hailed because he uh, opposes the dissolution of Yugoslavia as the sort of protector of an imagined Serbian national interest within uh, the Third International. 
And this, uh, this reaches uh, its peak in the 1990s with this uh, book, uh, which you see on the left, uh, Comintern, The Yugoslav and the Serbian Question by Branislav Gligorievic, a really well written and meticulously researched book. It's still an excellent source, but very much suffering from methodological and sometimes really outright Serbian nationalism. And this has led to really weird perceptions to the point that Markovic is still remembered in some circles as this Serb patriot communist. And this even resulted in the very nationalist Serbian Academy of Sciences and Arts publishing an edited volume in his honor in 2018 to mark the uh, 130th anniversary of his birth. And you can see that on the right there. Uh, I want to question both of these stories because my claim is that Sima Markovic was actually a Luxembourgist. And this is a very rare claim uh, in historiography. You only find it basically in the Walker Connors book on uh, the national question in the 1980s and nowhere else. Uh, but uh, I'll explain what I mean by that uh, once I move to the next slide and yeah, mapping the so-called rightists. Uh, so the common thread of the rightists in the Communist Party of Yugoslavia was a shared skepticism of the revolutionary potential of nationalism. Uh, but they differed amongst themselves on many other things. Basically because of this skepticism of revolutionary potential of nationalism, they came to be seen as rightists because it was seen that you know they want to preserve the territorial status quo, which essentially means they want to preserve the positions uh, of the Serbian monarchical ruling class in Belgrade, hence the idea that they are right. Uh, but I would actually claim that because they are skeptical of the revolutionary potential of nationalism, they actually criticize Leninism from the left. And they are more akin to uh, you know, writings of uh, Rosa Luxemburg or Anton Panikok and so on. Um, and there were different kinds, as I mentioned. So uh, first, uh, on the right there, you have a man who perhaps was the only kind of rightist. His name is uh, Života Milojković. And uh, Milojković led a group of uh, Yugoslav nationalists in a way. Uh, so he was uh, the last person in the Communist Party of Yugoslavia with his group of supporters who still believed in the idea that Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes are one nation. And he was basically saying, even if the ruling class now is pushing Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes further apart from one another, that does not change the fact that they are one nation and that we as communists and as internationalists should obviously aim to turn them into one nation because it's always better to have a larger transnational sort of you know, nation state than, uh, than enforcing small parochial nationalisms. Uh, he was kind of you know, rightist on questions such as the trade unions. He very much wanted to just kind of and the communist trade unions joined them with the social democrats and this is what also got him into trouble and he was the only guy who was actually expelled from the party in the 1920s everybody else kind of find a, found a way to coexist with the comintern then the other people you see on the bottom left it's a married couple uh, draga and lazar stefanovic they were trade union leaders uh, from belgrade and uh, draga and lazar were actually leninists so they were called rightists but they completely shared uh, the Leninist uh, idea of self-determination. Uh, they actively supported self-determination for places like Slovenia, Croatia, and Macedonia. And they believed that the revolution is just around the corner, even in the mid 1920s. However, they opposed the communist collaboration with the Croatian Republican Peasant Party. Uh, that was the main opposition party in the country. As the name suggests, it was also against the monarchy. Uh, and they claimed that this is not, in fact, a peasant party, but a bourgeois party. And they were, in a, in a way, vindicated in the mid-1920s when the party dropped Republican from its name and just entered the royal government and began supporting the monarchy. So they were called rightists basically because of a disagreement on, uh, on tactics rather than strategy. Uh, and then we move on to Markovic, and Markovic was the one who based his analysis, unlike Stefanovic couple who thought that the revolution is around the corner, on the belief that the revolutionary wave has actually passed. So that was a central point uh, of Sima Markovic. Not that the revolution is still about to happen, as Comintern and Zinoviev in particular claim, but that there is going to be a period of stabilization of capitalism. Um, and then this brings us uh, to his most famous work, The National Question in the Light of Marxism. Uh, and uh, he writes this uh, during this debate. You have basically a public debate in the party press in 23 and 24. A lot of people are also responding to his book. He's responding to other people and so on. 
And uh, what is truly interesting about this debate is that Markovic is the only person in the entire debate who refers to Stalin. Uh, so he's the only one who seems to be familiar with Stalin's work on the national question. He uses uh, Stalin's premises, and this is considered at the time to be, you know, kind of the quintessential Leninist text on what a nation is. And no one else in the Yugoslav party does that. So he's kind of positioning himself as the most loyal and most well-read Bolshevik. He's the guy who understands what the Russians are about. And this is where problems would start, you know. Uh, but his idea, you know, in spite of the stories of him being some sort of a Serbian patriot, his central idea is what the Comintern also thinks and what a lot of Yugoslav communists think, which is that this fundamentally good idea of Yugoslav unity was betrayed by what he calls the greater Serbian bourgeoisie. So the, uh, you know, kind of the mixture of Serbian capitalists, you know, essentially weaker than Croatian and Slovenian capitalists, but enjoying the support of the monarchy and the army to, you know, crucially important institutions in the country and therefore kind of manipulating the entire country to their liking. Um, however, Markovic says that in spite of this you know, kind of original sin of the greater Serbian bourgeoisie, we have an equal culpability of nationalisms, you know, because even the Croatian and Slovene nationalisms which react to this, they are still nationalisms. And uh, Markovic rejects uh, both Leninist self-determination until secession and even federalism because he says these nationalist parties, they don't really want any of this stuff. You know, even the Croatian Peasant Party, they're not calling for an independent Croatia. They just want their rights within Yugoslavia. So his political solution is autonomy. And this is why Markovic gets called an Austro-Marxist because he proposes autonomy. Um, However, this is not exactly true because Markovic talks about you know, a fairly standard idea of territorial autonomy. He doesn't talk about personal autonomy. He's not, uh, a lot of his uh, work actually, you know, several of the opening chapters are dedicated to him attacking uh, people such as Rosa Luxemburg and Otto Bauer and saying both of these people were wrong on the national questions, but the question, but the Bolsheviks were right. Uh, so he's not exactly that. His idea of autonomy is more related to this analysis that the revolutionary wave has passed. And he's trying to say, um, uh, we cannot, uh, you know, uh, we cannot kind of fully stop these nationalist forces, but we can pacify them for the time being. And if we are talking about federalism or if we're talking about secessionism, we are basically going to move everybody's attention away from class struggle onto national struggle. And he, this is what he was really concerned with. And, we, you know, the, here we see the Lux Luxembourgism in him. He doesn't want the workers to focus on the national question because he thinks this would be detrimental to the unity of working class. Um, it's just that his solution is autonomy uh, because uh, basically because he thinks that that is the least painful way of resolving the national question. And he believes that once autonomy is achieved, these ruling classes will be pacified in terms of national struggles, which would then pave the way for pure sort of, you know, pure in quotation marks class struggle. And he was uh, first attacked as a Luxembourgist in that context uh, at the time by Ante Ziliga, uh, a Croatian communist who is also a fascinating character. I could go on about him, but basically he's the leader of the so-called left faction in the 1920s. He then becomes a Trotskyist and later uh, after escaping Soviet Union, he becomes uh, a Croatian far-right nationalist and later collaborates with the Ustasha regime. Uh, but at the time, Ziliga is still a communist, and he reads Markovic, and he's the first person to say this is Luxembourgism. Um, but I think that, uh, in a way, Markovic is Luxembourgism in reverse, uh, because what Markovic is saying is that uh, uh, the national question can be resolved under capitalism through autonomy, whereas Luxembourg's idea was precisely that we should ignore the national question because it can never be resolved under capitalism anyway. And uh, that's, again, I think, a sort of a moment of Austro-Marxism that we can see in Markovic. You know, maybe he, he will not have acknowledged either influences of Luxembourg or uh, Renner or Bauer or anyone like that, but uh, he thinks that the national question can be resolved within a capitalist system in a multinational state. So that's kind of also the Austro-Marxist moment that he has. Um, and so I want to see, you know, how did the Comintern define Austro-Marxism? Because it's fairly obvious that he's not an Austro-Marxist, in spite of some of these things. Uh, so, you know, the, uh, 
obviously there's a lot of bad blood between the communist international and the social democrats you know not in the least because of the support for the first world war but also because of the murders of rosa luxemburg and karl liebknecht and so on uh, but uh, that hatred turns into the ambiguity of the United Front in 21-22 when the Comintern begins to acknowledge that revolutions in the rest of Europe have failed and that you should maybe start collaborating with the workers' organizations again. But, you know, already at one of the early Comintern congresses, Austro-Marxism was described as a sort of a false left wing of social democracy that has to be fought against. So you always have this kind of ambiguity. And I think also Marxism is chosen uh, here uh, as a tool of Bolshevization. So in my view, Bolshevization is a process that took place between 1917 and 1922. That is basically when communists throughout Europe and throughout the world with all sorts of revolutionary upheavals, whether it's, you know, the German Revolution, the Hungarian Soviet Republic, or, you know, minor uprisings in places like Bulgaria or Yugoslavia, they come to accept the basic tenets of Bolshevism. But the slogan of Bolshevization is proclaimed in 1924, and it's proclaimed right after Lenin had died at the Fifth Comintern Congress. And I think uh, Bolshevization there was essentially uh, what McDermott and uh, Jeremy Agnew had called um, Stalinization in its embryonic form. So Bolshevization in 1924 is not about making these parties Bolshevik because they already are. It's rather about narrowing down what Bolshevism means. Uh, and kind of pushing the organizational model of, uh, the, com uh, of the Bolshevik party. And, um, and this, is, uh, uh, this is basically uh, why Austro-Marxism is chosen as an attack on Markovic. They are seen as kind of the arch nemesis of Bolshevism when it comes to the national question. And therefore Markovic has to be attacked as such rather than a, a Luxembourg is because there's still a relatively positive opinion of Luxembourg uh, until the 1930s. Um, so, uh, there's also a very important point there, which is that when Ciliga first attacks uh, Markovic in 23 and uh, in the early 24, he is attacked by other comrades who actually agree with Ciliga rather than Markovic. And they're saying, you know, your accusations are slanderous. You're calling this man a counter revolutionary. You're calling him, you know, you're calling him Luxembourgist for no reason. He's just a good Leninist and so on. But then when the debates in the common turn start, Markovic is faced with those same accusations from the Comintern. So you can kind of see how the Comintern itself facilitates also the uh, deteriorating atmosphere of interpersonal relations because the things that were considered unacceptable in a debate within the party within a couple of years very quickly become acceptable. And, you know, that later culminates in the expulsion of Markovic and, you know, even with his execution in the 1930s. Uh, so to conclude, um, I think um, so the story of Austro-Marxism in Yugoslavia, in spite of this very dominant narrative of uh, the Austro-Marxist right opposition, uh, has to be reconsidered. I think the, most people who were actual Austro-Marxists ended up in the Socialist Party of Yugoslavia, which split uh, from the Communist Party at its second Congress. Uh, and there were very, very few actual Austro-Marxists within the Yugoslav Communist Party, mostly in Slovenia, and they were expelled by the mid-1920s. Uh, but this research, aside from questioning that, I think also helps to question the left-right divide that was established by the Comintern, where the party left in the 20s, the left faction, are the people who support uh, Lenin's self-determination until secession, and the right are people who oppose it and who are even in the view of the common turn late, latent nationalists. What I'm trying to show is that actually it's quite the opposite. Even these people on the so-called party right are criticizing Leninism from the left. And all of this overall helps us also rethink the history of the Communist Party of Yugoslavia. Uh, on one hand, it questions the nationalist stereotypes of Moscow control, which is the story that, you know, the Comintern just wants to abolish Yugoslavia because they hate the Serbs and which, you know, is just ridiculous, completely fails to take into account the strategy and tactics of world revolution and especially of Balkan federalism, which is the central point for communist uh, analysis and strategy. And then also the liberal stereotypes of Moscow control because, you know, you can't take some imaginary um, ahistorical standards of liberal democracy and just say that because Markovic opposed the Comintern in the 1920s, that automatically makes him a Democrat and makes the Comintern anti-democratic because the story is far more complex than that. And even the whole process of the Stalinization of the Comintern, you know, I'm now researching it. I'm not even sure if Stalinization is a good term. I find the whole 
concepts that are kind of methodologically lacking in a lot of ways. And finally, why was Markovic a problem ultimately? I think uh, Markovic was uh, not a problem because he was an Austro-Marxist. He was not a problem because he was a brave Serbian patriot standing up to Stalin. You know, Stalin is not in 1925, Stalin is not the Stalin of 1935. It's normal in the commentary that you're polemicizing. And this is, you know, just kind of ethnocentric, like, you know, our guy ended up criticizing Stalin, but it wasn't really about that at all. I mean, he was a problem because of he referred to Stalin, but that's because he was using Stalin's theories and Stalin's theoretical legitimacy and the general Bolshevik theoretical legitimacy to reach conclusions which in the view of the Bolsheviks were fundamentally in contradiction with their doctrine. So that was the main reason why Markovich was a problem. And that's the main reason ultimately why also Marxism was chosen as the accusation as the sort of arch enemy of Bolshevism on the national question. Thank you very much. Stefan, uh, and now I would like again to open the floor for questions, comments, and so on. We have 15 minutes for, for that. Yes, Walter Bauer. Uh, thank you very much for the excellent presentation. Uh, sorry, thank you very much for this excellent presentation. Um, I, I wonder if you could say a couple of words about the special characteristic of the Serbian Socialist Party before World War One, And uh, secondly, uh, could you uh, elaborate uh, more on the particular understanding of self-determination by uh, Markovic in, in the early stage of his, his political development? Thank you very much, uh, Walter. So first, uh, about the Serbian Social Democratic Party. Uh, it's, it's a very interesting party. Essentially, you know, it's a party strongly in the orthodox Marxist tradition of uh, the Second International. And <clears throat> that means they're a strictly proletarian party focusing on economic struggles. And because of the awareness of the kind of peripheral position uh, of their country and the predominant peasant nature of their country, they're essentially looking up to SPD in Germany. And uh, this, uh, you know, all the Balkan parties consider SPD uh, the model party. And uh, the thing is that, um, that they are kind of hoping for the revolution in Germany. Uh, and they have a major paradigm shift between 1914 and 1917. Most of them, uh, because uh, I guess not many, uh, maybe not many people know, but it was one of the few parties that uh, unilaterally opposed the First World War alongside the uh, Bulgarian Narrows and the Russian Bolsheviks. Uh, so, you know, they get completely disillusioned with the SPD. Uh, and they're kind of soul searching and Leninism prevails in 1917 and 1918 because it seems to kind of offer a way out of their dilemmas. And I think, uh, but Lenin, uh, I think reasons for the success of Leninism must be sought not only in the failure of SPD, and that I think ties in with the question of self-determination, because the, the position of Serbia as a small country and Balkan countries as small countries in general makes these people acutely aware of imperialism in the early 1900s. So they don't develop a theory of imperialism. Most of them are not familiar with what Lenin is writing at the time, perhaps not even Luxembourg, uh, but they, they understand <laughs> the intricacies of imperialism. And we have the famous debate between Tutsovic and Rena in 1908, where, you know, Tutsovic is kind of the hero of anti-imperialism and Rena is offering an uh, apologetic view of the uh, Austrian annexation of Bosnia. So I think we also need to understand uh, this, that these people speak of self-determination even very early on. They're also aware, obviously, of the repression in the Ottoman Empire and the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the two states that they're sandwiched in, in between. And at the same time, of course, they are amazing internationalists. So uh, Dusan Popovic, one of the leading members who unfortunately dies in 1918, uh, he writes to uh, Trotsky in 1916. And he says, uh, uh, you know, if any country, if any country's socialists had the right to support the war, it's us, the Serbs. 
you know, because Serbia is a victim of Austro-Hungarian aggression, and it's very blatantly obvious. But this is not an Austro-Hungarian-Serbian war. This is a world war, and we as proletarian internationalists have a duty to oppose it. So they have this very acute, uh, acute awareness of internationalism, of uh, you know, a different idea of self-determination. And that brings me to the second point, which is that you know, they speak of self-determination, uh, but before 1914, self-determination for them is a democratic principle in the tradition of the Second International. You know, it's the principle that kind of rests on the idea that you know, people of a, certain, uh, uh, of a certain geographical region have the right to choose what political entity they would live under rather than have it imposed by these old and kind of crumbling empires. Uh, but this changes, and this is also what they struggle with in the early 20s. You know, some like Markovic, I think, never fully adopted. But this changes with the input from Bolshevism, because for Lenin, the principle of self-determination is a fundamental strategic point in, uh, in the, what he sees as the global revolutionary chain. And we were mentioning that yesterday. Lenin obviously wasn't the only one who made this connection, right? That, Something is clearly happening in the countries where capitalism is just coming, uh, coming to the historical stage. So Russia has a revolution, then Turkey, then Iran. And uh, for Lenin, the idea is that in these places, because they are still not fully developed industrial capitalist societies, you need to develop a triple alliance of the workers, the peasantry, and the national movements. The national movements usually being the expression of the class aspirations of those peasants, even if they're articulated as national. So uh, that's a completely different new idea of self-determination. You can see in 1918, 1919, the Yugoslavs still don't really get this, but uh, they make a concerted effort in the early 1920s to embrace this. And I think this has to be attributed not only to kind of blindly following the directives from Moscow, but also the genuine admiration and desire to emulate the one model that worked, because as other revolutions fail, the Bolshevik uh, revolution just gains more and more prestige. Uh, do we have other questions? Yes, uh, Una? Okay, more of, thank you. Uh, for this, but it's a more like uh, explanation because I'm like I would just like to know more about this because uh, if I'm correct, uh, Markovic, uh, Sima Markovic wrote this uh, book on national question the tra on the tragedy of small people. So if you could just say something more about this because we talked about this kind of like the also connection with the imperialist imperialism and like this, yeah. If you can say something more. Uh, well, it. to be perfectly honest, it's the only book by him that I haven't read because it's the only one that hasn't been digitized. Oh. <laughs> and, and now in the pandemic, you know, it's, it's been like two years that I've been trying to get my hands on it and I haven't. So okay. unfortunately, I can't help you more with that particular work. <laughs> That's okay. That's fine. And I have one question. Uh, I, I, I read very long time ago about it, but it, uh, I don't know how, how you think about, about this national determination. It is very interesting that before the end of the, sec of the First World War, uh, in Serbia, there was um, general acceptance of the self-determination, Leninist and so on, every nation should live, blah, blah, because I suppose that it was, uh, and then you, you see the shift in the 20s. And is it maybe, especially in the Serbian context, the shift uh, before the uh, 1918, Serbia was a small peripheral uh, sandwiched uh, country who really was like, um, could it identify with the, with the oppressed uh, from both empires. And then after the 18th, actually Serbia becomes uh, quasi uh, greater Serbia of the kingdom of Yugoslavia. So that the position of of the socialists speaking about the national self-determination changes significantly because of the changed uh, circumstances. Uh, do you remember some literature about uh, the, the examples of, of, of such a shift or do you think that, that it, it, it really has happened? Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely correct. That, that definitely happens. And I think that's, again, important for truly understanding this rather than falling for some nationalist mystifications because you know you have this completely senseless idea that for some reason they they hate serbia no the point is always about relationship of forces right so the, the idea is marxism is not some sort of a 
you know, universal set of principles, that would be, that would be idealism. Materialism, uh, Marxism rests on material conditions. And if the material conditions have changed to such a degree that Serbia has went from being an oppressed state to oppressing everyone in a new state, obviously we now have to start opposing it, even if we agreed earlier on. So that is definitely the essence, yes. Uh, and, and there's a lot of literature, uh, that was the main issue even in you know the historiography of socialist Yugoslavia in the 70s and 80s it was always um, uh, most of the stuff that was written on the theoretical debates of Yugoslav communists has been written on the national question yeah. i can i can send you some pdfs almost all of it is digitized yeah and you have the general division of you know people who kind of it's very obvious people who ag agree with the left faction you know, even if they might be attacked that they are supporting people who want to destroy, you wanted to destroy Yugoslavia in the 1920s, these people end up being pro-Yugoslav in some cases even remain Marxist historians into the 90s and the 2000s for as long as they live. Whereas those who claim that they are, you know, trying to defend these forgotten democratic traditions of Sima Marković, they all become Serbian nationalists, they all become supporters of Milosevic. Very interesting. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, do we have uh, other questions? Uh, yes, we still have uh, four minutes, five minutes. So uh, please, Walter, uh, take the floor. I want us to have a disillusioned uh, view on the Leninist uh, politics of, uh, of nation. Uh, I would say that the, 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 the only real achievement of Comintern uh, lies in the recognition of the revolutionary, revolutionary potential of India, Iran, uh, and the so-called peoples of the East. But when it comes generally to the national question, I think uh, Lenin's uh, position was purely instrumental, uh, which you can easily show by uh, how he treated the national question before and after the revolution. Yeah, yeah. The and uh, I think uh, if you compare the positions of also Luxembourg, uh, Otto Bauer, Karl Renner on the one side with the Leninist position, uh, you can conclude that uh, for Lenin, the national question actually was an instrument of smashing the empire. It was a, a tool for, for revolutionizing the masses. While on the other side, for Luxembourg and Bauer, let alone all the differences which they have, um, it, it, it was the question of how you can claim hegemony, how you can claim hegemony under the conditions uh, of a more or less existing parliamentary democracy. So again, it's so to say the division between East and West, while Lenin completely, and I think he was right, everything against the empire uh, was, so to say, historically seen progressive. While on the other side, the problem of the Austro-Marxists and also of also Luxembourg, how to deal with the question to claim leadership uh, in a country which was more developed than, uh, than Russia has been at that time. And that's why uh, I believe that um, so to say, to explain the difference in the national question between Lenin and the other ones is more reflecting the different conditions in Russia and in Europe than it could be explained through, so to say, um, ideological or, or uh, principled um, uh, issues related to the question. I think you're absolutely right. Uh, I would add one small caveat, which is that Lenin still has some sort of an ambiguity later on. You know, so that is why, you know, you have U uh, Soviet Ukraine and Soviet Belarus because the Bolsheviks prevail there, but you don't have, you know, they don't immediately proceed to invade places like the Baltic states or Finland or something like that. And the real, the real turning point is the. Uh, and uh, the annexation uh, of the countries uh, in the uh, in the Caucasus, because uh, that's that's the main issue. That's one of the last things that Lenin writes about before uh, his stroke. You know, these are the countries that are virtually annexed uh, by uh, by Soviet Russia. And first off, he endorses it. Then he gets more information from there, and he kind of goes back on it. And he says, "Well, I, you know, actually, we we made a mess here. This is not." you know, okay, yeah, we wanted to instrumentalize nationalism, but also if we are just annexing countries and imposing socialism there, we are not actually, you know, we're not actually a proletarian internationalist force. 
we are becoming yet another, you know, another country in danger of becoming an imperial country, which I would say ultimately happens. Uh, but yes, uh, the, in the long run, I think that it was one of the it was one of the most important achievements of Leninism because it provided a direct inspiration of anti-colonial struggles and it facilitated, you know, basically third world liberation throughout the 20th century, which is a great success. Uh, but ultimately, uh, this national self-determination is always a tricky thing to toy with. And I think especially today after the experience of the 20th century, you know, we've really seen that in practice all of these uh all of these so uh, you know communist movements that would be or socialist movements that would talk about socialism and national independence very soon after the national independence would be achieved they would just drop the socialism bit right you know, cuba being an honorable exception perhaps but we'll see where that's going to go as well